So I'm going to come to the, uh, the half of the panel over here to um, my left. Um, I've lost my card. No, I'm not to worry about that. I'll come back. I, I always have this problem when I'm, I'm moderating. I make so many copious notes and I've lost the, the correct note before I then come to the next panelist. Um, but what I do have at least is, is who the panelists are. And um, so I'm going to come first of all to um, Ilona Rauser, who you've heard already, who is the director of ESPON. So over to you, um, Ilona, for your um, uh, round of introduction. Yes, thank you. Thank you, John, and good afternoon, everybody. So let me share with you um, some observations and also um, the conclusions and, and uh, advice uh, that we have arrived at within ESPON's research in relation to uh, the future of governance. Um, ESPON's analysis on uh, current and future territorial development trends uh, reveals uh, increasing interdependencies among places. And secondly, it also reveals what we call the mismatch of economic geographies and administrative borders. And what we see that, well, considering that we live uh, in what we also can call the space of flows, uh, social and economic developments in one place have uh, major impacts on the development perspectives in other places, and therefore we see that indeed administrative borders become less important in terms of development as uh, functional areas of different sizes uh, and characters uh, shape territorial uh, development in Europe. And these range from functional urban areas to cross-border regions to transnational and also macro regions and also to global integration uh, zones. And these links between places and the need also to develop territories regarding their functional interdependencies imply that nowadays a single administrative territory cannot anymore disregard the developments in uh, other places in its policy, uh, policy pathways and policy perspectives. And these trends raise the need really to address development challenges beyond administrative borders and also accordingly to adapt governance, planning, and investment systems, and also practices. So in the framework of the current ESPAN program, we have studied different governance and planning practices around Europe, and we have revealed that a number of countries are currently rethinking their governance and planning models and shifting towards sh uh, shared governance, cooperative planning, and joint investment. Uh, so we observe uh, emerging shared governance models at the scales of functional urban areas, at the scales of cross-border areas, as well as models linked to specific geographical or functional features, either for mountainous areas or areas around certain lakes and, and rivers. And we see uh, interesting practices of developing uh, soft territorial uh, cooperation uh, models also around Europe and er Eric knows also everything about it because of one of our studies that was, uh, that was uh, specifically devoted to studying soft territorial cooperation uh, models in, in Europe. Um, so ESPON's research uh, has revealed a number of benefits uh, of using such shared governance and, and also cooperative planning Models, firstly, it allows you to mobilize resources for territorial development, also achieve the necessary critical mass for promoting competitiveness. Secondly, it allows places at the same time to develop their profile or specialization, but also through cooperation to achieve the necessary economic diversification at a broader geographical scale and therefore ensure long-term resilience. Uh, furthermore, which is also important in the context of the future cohesion policy, it also allows to avoid duplicating activities and therefore wasteful investment. Uh, and also I would mention that it helps to ensure in general terms more and better results with the limited resources that we have and public resources are usually limited and also better impact and return on investment. At the same time, uh, within ESPON, we have also identified a number of preconditions uh, that define the success of such uh, cooperative planning and governance uh, models. Uh, firstly, um, we see, and our researchers also have come to a conclusion and the policy advice that identifying a common interest and a potential benefit of cooperation should be the real starting point for designing such models. Uh, 
Uh, furthermore, we see that achieving a common understanding between actors on the mutual benefits and also interdependencies is much more important than establishing legal and financial frameworks. And in principle, also, researchers have come up to the conclusion that it actually doesn't matter. Either it's a, a soft or hard cooperation model, either it's a top-down or a bottom-up model, they can be very different solutions, very different approaches that are tailored to the actual, you know, specificities of the place and the needs of the place. But what is indeed important is that there is this, uh, the, 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 the starting point is understanding what is the joint interest, what is the common benefit, and how can all the actors contribute to actually um, achieving the results of cooperation. And therefore, also, uh, one of the preconditions is related, preconditions is related to combining top-down incentives, by that we mean a, a certain policy framework or a legislative framework or the, the rules of the game, so to say, with uh, bottom-up uh, collaboration initiatives. And we see also that uh, in, in those successful cases that the cooperation has usually started from uh, a limited amount of commonly recognizable issues that most actors understand where cooperation is necessary, where it's indispensable, for example, in the field of transport or in the field of environment. And this was the starting point. And once you get the results and you get inspired by the results of the cooperation, you can move on and you can expand this cooperation to additional uh, fields and additional uh, subjects. But what is important is that fine-tuning cooperation takes time and that cooperation really has to bring results in order to encourage people to continue. If it doesn't bring results, then unfortunately we have seen also cases that whatever agreements you have had, it doesn't matter. Whatever framework you have is, is established, it doesn't matter. If you don't see practical results of such cooperation, it can get quite easily um, disrupted. Uh, at the same time, it's very important that these cooperation models are based both on the principle of multi-level cooperation between the different planning authorities at national, regal, uh, regional and local levels and also involve a wide range of stakeholders, not only public sector but also private businesses and, and non-governmental organizations. It's also important that th this cooperation is... Uh, takes the form of working towards the minimum gain for all. Uh, there is an important uh, principle of transparency to be ensured. Uh, political leadership, political engagement is always mentioned as one key precondition. Uh, there, there is a need for political leaders and political drivers who really believe in the benefits of such cooperation, who can actually support this process on, on a long-term uh, basis. And finally, I would also mention as one important precondition is that those functional governance and planning practices should actually be integrated and embedded into the mainstream planning and governance practices. So they should not become just a simply standalone solutions or innovative measures that once have been taken but are not really accepted. So they have to find their place uh, and their role and their links within the conventional administrative, within the conventional administrative systems. Uh, so we have plenty of good practi practice examples around Europe, but what we believe in ESPON is that we need to move forward from these examples and from good practices and experience to this as a mainstream practice that would be implemented at all governance levels. And here we also see a very important role for the future cohesion policy to, for such practices to involve. We see that uh, policy implementation tools like, for example, integrated territorial investment has already promoted this change and has made also people think about the need to plan and govern uh, their, their development at those functional scales. But I have to say that availability of funding, of course, cannot be the only, the only motivation. Uh, we see that draft regulations for the future of cohesion policy, they currently provide quite favorable grounds for further stimulating the use of such governance and planning approaches through shared governance, through cooperative planning, through joint investment at functional scales. But we, on the behalf of ESPON, would propose to further strengthen those provisions. Uh, and we believe that if it's only left at the discretion of member states um, um, and, and is kept only as a voluntary approach, 
then uh, this might not evolve as uh, a common practice. Thank you. Thank you, and so moving on to our next speaker, he is Helmut Heiss, who is Managing Director at Rosenack and Partners, uh, and is also going to talk about, or is from the TIPS project as well. So Helmut, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, good, afternoon, good afternoon from my side as well. Uh, I will continue with the topic uh, of governance, um, but with um, governance uh, uh, of territorial policies at the European level, uh, we prepared, um, on behalf of the Austrian Presidency, a DG seminar. It was called Future Options and Perspectives for the Post-2020 Governance of Territorial Policies in, per <coughs> in general and <coughs> the territorial agenda in particular. It was one month ago at the same place here in this room. Uh, at the same, yes, on the same uh, stage. Uh, I would like uh, to share with you my impressions and my conclusions out uh, from this task. Uh, I will offer more an outside perspective as we are usually not so much involved in territorial policies uh, at the European level, but more on the ground, uh, for example, uh, by supporting the implementation of territorial tools of the easy funds like leader, uh, agglomeration strategies within urban earmarking and so on. Uh, so what have been my learnings uh, about governance, about the governance system of territorial policies at uh, the European level? Uh, from me, with this uh, approach from outside, uh, the landscape of territorial policies at the European level is uh, quite manifold and complex, in particular if you are not an insider. Uh, it has been developed step by step uh, over the last decades, um, consists of different elements and rely uh, on soft policies like the territorial agenda, the urban agenda, or the macro-regional strategies. Uh, but the relevant policies producing spatial impacts, are they, I call them hard sectoral and funding policies. <clears throat> there is no competence for territorial policies at the European level, as you all know. Uh, so place-based policy, uh, Policies at the European level are dependent on place-based approaches within sectoral and funding policies. But these policies often are spatially blind, as we all know. The only way to strengthen place-based approaches within sectoral and funding policies is to influence their performance by soft policies. For me, soft policies seem to be the key uh, to trigger place-based approaches at the European level. But soft policies are based on cooperation and collaboration at the same eye level, and uh, they need elaborated innovative governance mechanism. Macro-regional macro strategies and the urban agenda open the floor for such uh, new approaches. But this governance mechanism, uh, let's say, take place in a parallel world to the traditional system of government and administration. They have uh, the character of add-ons beside the administrative routines, but mostly without sufficient personal, financial, and organizational resources. In such governance systems, hierarchy doesn't work. It needs a lot of experience, management know-how, know-how to moderate groups, organize participation, design large-scale um, events, and ensure cooperation. In one word, highly professional requirements. If such experimental approaches succeed at the end in producing results, uh, the traditional uh, systems of government and administration is 
let's say, sometimes overstrained to, di to digest uh, the outcomes, which, from my point of view, came clearly out uh, at the DG seminar. There seem to be serious bottlenecks to take up the results and to integrate them in the routines of the policy and administration system. Uh, such new experimental governance systems are, uh, from my point of view, in a trap between high expectations and insufficient resources, additional engagement of all which are participating in such partnerships beyond their daily routines and insufficient taking up of the recommendations, proposals, or results. My impression of the DG seminar was that everybody knows uh, that there is a need for something which goes beyond the routines and the ongoing practice, uh, but the experimental stage of soft policies overburdens the system in the long run. This leads uh, to hesitation to support and extend the approaches due to capacity restraints. The result is what we have at the moment, in particular as regards the territorial agenda, something in between. It costs resources, but not too much, because it doesn't lead to serious consequences. So my conclusion is that the soft policy approach based on cooperation and collaboration implemented by innovative governance mechanism should be more established as integrated part of the government and administration system and not stay as an exotic alien but as accepted part of the policy system equipped with clear owner and leadership personal, financial, and knowledge resources and mechanism of the integration of the outcomes of such policy systems. The discussion of post-2020 might be the opportunity to decide uh, if the European Union <coughs> should scale up the place-based approaches and the governance system of territorial policies at the European level or to scale down to a system of pro providing maybe research results like the <coughs> products of ESPON for everybody to whom it may concern. To stay in between is a frustrating position from my perspective. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much indeed. And our final speaker in this round before we then come to the questions and answers is Vincent Nadim who's chairman of the Department of Urbanism at the Technical University of Delft in the Netherlands. So, Vincent, over to you. Thank you. We had two great presentations this morning, really very good. And um, I saw them or listened to them as a town planner. I'm a town planner, and I thought that I could address the, some of the issues that they raised through planning. Um, I see planning as uh, it's the part of the governance mechanisms that brings evidence to bear, as we had here. It creates or should create good arguments. And part of those good arguments are about working across territorial boundaries outside of those containers. At least in principle, that's how planning might operate. Um, but one thing that wasn't touched upon this morning was just the scale of the uh, challenge that faces planners. And I don't think anybody mentioned the, what I call the investment industries, uh, both public and private. In the public, so we have investment industries who are seeking to make profit from speculation on land. That's their job. I'm not against that but it makes a huge challenge for anybody who wants to intervene and lead and guide spatial development. And one example is that two house building companies in the UK made um, a 1 billion euro profit in 2017 from a revenue of only four or five billion. 
And they're making that not from, principally, from building houses. I don't know, need to tell you the rest of the story. With that sort of issue, and these are the people, and there are public sector developers doing the same thing. It's these sort of people who are, have the strong arguments, who say to citizens and to politicians, I can solve your problem. And we've got to come up with better arguments. I'm not fond of the word narrative myself. I think argument's a better word. But I'm really here, that was to touch on the papers this morning, and perhaps I will continue to do that. I'm really here to tell you a little bit more about uh, findings from the Compass Project, the Espon Compass Project, which we completed recently, looking at the state of spatial planning in Europe. If we want planning to help with these things, then we need to know something about its condition. So the objectives were to describe and explain how planning has changed over 20 years since the EU compendium of planning policies was produced for 15 countries back in 1997. And in particular, we wanted to know about the relationship between those changes and the EU policies and EU law and the EU discourse. It's not a new compendium, by the way. You can download it from the website, um, but it is not a new compendium. It might evolve into it. I need to talk to Ilona about that. <laughs> um, we had to rely on expert opinion for this as well, with all the weaknesses that apply there. It's not um, a strong empirical research. I've got some good and bad news anyway about the state of planning. Do you want the good news or the bad news? or the good news than the less good news? Well, the good news for planning is that it's in, I, in some ways, it's in a healthy condition. I, I must say I was surprised. There's an awful lot of planning going on at all, lots of different levels and lots of reform and changes in planning. Thinking, people are thinking about how to do things better. And so they're trying to change their planning systems and ways of doing things. Now, I'm generalizing here, of course, and massively oversimplifying. Uh, but one of the things that's happening there is that they're responding to something we discussed in the 1990s. We're still discussing it now. The spatial planning approach. Uh, we use the term territorial governance now. We're asking planning to address integration horizontally, vertically, across geographical boundaries and with different interests and st uh, groups and stakeholders. So I, I think in general, a positive thing to say is that we're seeing a trajectory towards a more spatial planning approach. Well, and, and that is good news. That's the first of five good points that I've got. The second one, more specifically, the horizontal integration is, is really happening. We see that happening now. A lot more strategic or strategies. And those strategies are happening at all levels, not just national and regional, but right down at local levels. We see more strategy making, and that's what will produce the horizontal integration. There's a big but here, which I'll come on to later. But um, the coordination across boundaries, this morning, Andreas Faludi showed us some really good graphics showing examples of uh, cooperation across boundaries at the European scale. This is happening very much at the local scale. There are hundreds and thousands of initiatives to create functional planning regions that people really understand rather than the uh, sort of jurisdictional boundaries. There's a lot more engagement, or at least attempts at engagement with citizens. And the tools are becoming more adaptive. We're putting aside the very rigid zoning approaches we tend to use and still use in a lot of places and looking for uh, uh, more adaptive tools. Of course, each one of these positive statements comes with a big question mark. I expect them to s start seeing them appearing on here on the questions on the Slido very soon. Does the engagement really matter? Is it symbolic or real? I can't tell you that yet. I think we need more evaluation of that performance. Now, the less positive points, uh, first of all, I think, about the vertical integration or the relationships between the EU and the member states and down through the regions to the local level. Um, that is not happening so well. <laughs> 
Of course, when we have environmental legislation, it's incorporated in many countries in the, in the planning system, and so there's a strong response there. And, and where the policy is important, especially on providing funding, of course the member states are going to respond to that. But in the general debate, or narrative as you're calling it here, then there isn't much learning between the EU and, the, um, and, and planning that's going on inside the member states. And one issue there is territorial cooperation or interreg. We've already heard a lot about that. It's rather disappointing, and I was surprised to learn that interreg is not very influential on the planning systems within the member states. There are always ex uh, exceptions, of course. And we, we've spent billions on this program, but it remains rather divorced from the mainstream uh, planning tools and procedures and policies that go on uh, within the planning systems. So that's a bit of a disappointment. I'm not saying we should axe that. I, I would think we should uh, continue with that, but change that. The horizontal uh, integration, I said there's a big but, and that big but is a relationship between spatial planning and cohesion policy. You know, at best, there's a real good... Uh, working relationship between the people who are responsible for the cohesion funds and those who are responsible for making spatial plans within, the, within countries. Um, perhaps you know some examples, I'd be keen to learn about them actually, where people responsible for the uh, uh, structural investment funds sit around the table with the spatial planners and argue over about the strategy that they ought to be adopting and how, what sort of projects that money should be funding. Perhaps you've got some examples. No. Well, perhaps you have. I think, at worst, what happens is that cohesion policy and spatial planning exist in parallel worlds. Parallel but separate worlds. It's been like that since the 1990s when I first got involved in this, and I'm afraid it still continues. There's a way of thinking which is a cohesion way of thinking, and there's a way of thinking which is a spatial planning way of thinking. I should say now, I'm going beyond the findings of the project and I'm trying to be provocative because that's what I was asked to do. Um, but I think there are, there are cultures, there's a cohesion. We could even do an experiment now. Who's, who sees themselves, take part, who sees themselves as part of the sort of cohesion uh, group or, or your main narrative is about cohesion policy and who sees themselves more as the spatial planning group who works with cohesion and who are the spatial planners yeah exactly this is one of the few occasions you get together um, we should thank Espon for that but you are living in separate worlds it's very apparent to me from the work that we've been doing uh, a second thing that happens on the horizontal or the cohesion policy and spatial planning that came out of the project, and one of my colleagues is in the audience who uh, led this part of the project, but we see cohesion policy actually contradicting plans, contradicting strategies, and, and leading to unsustainable development. We saw a few examples this morning with the white elephants. Well, of course, they get a lot of publicity, but there's a lot more routine urban development which is not following the principles and uh, policies that are set out in the planning system. And then also, cohesion policy is tending to use bolt-on mechanisms. So we use uh, CLLDs. Somebody remind me of what that really means, for those who don't know. And we use integrated territorial investment schemes. And we've used LEADER as well. They're all things that belong to cohesion policy. They're replacing the planning system. They're not helping to connect planning and cohesion policy. They're in fact inserting a wedge between them, in my view, and here I am going beyond the project, I have to say. I have some sympathy with this, because in many places, spatial planning is simply not fit for purpose to help to direct the cohesion funds. Cohesion policy is not fit. The timescales, the processes, the capacity in regions and municipalities. It's not there to be able to do that job. And then, and then 
I'm being asked to wind up. And then third, th finally, and, uh, and this is a really difficult point, but we asked about the effectiveness of uh, spatial planning policies. If we're talking about the health of planning, we need to know how effective it is. It's a really difficult question. Do planning strategies and policies have any influence on shaping spatial development? And um, it's difficult. We, do ask question, we did ask questions like this. And I think very broadly, and a very rough answer is that one third of countries or the experts would say that yes, we're playing an important role here. Without hesitation, they say that this is happening. But then we have another third, well, we have a third in between, but then we have another third who say that, well, no, we're producing the plans, we're adopting them, we're engaging the citizens on the plans, but they're not having a lot of influence. In fact, in some cases, they're not having any influence. Now, that's not surprising, given the crisis that we've been through since 2007-8, uh, but it's something we knew, do need to address really, really very uh, directly. So, in many ways, spatial planning is healthy. We're moving in the right direction, uh, but we need a lot more work on it. Thank you. Right, the, um, uh, the second half of the panel here has, has, has woken everyone up on Slido, so there are a whole slew of questions that have come in um, in light of those, uh, those interventions. Uh, some of the top questions are up there on the, uh, uh, on the screen. Um, two questions particularly for um, Elono. Um, how can territorial evidence be brought to bear on policy makers? Um, and related to that, there's a question about how you improve um, or so change outdated administrative behaviors to make sure that evidence is taken into account. Uh, so those were two potentially um, uh, for you. And there are two as well that um, I'd like um, uh, Vincent as well to um, uh, potentially have a go at. And these might be, have a wider concern for all of the panelists. Um, is there a need for a European strategic, uh, strategic plan for spatial development? or even a Europe-wide spatial planning authority, uh, if such a thing could even be created, um, are two further questions which have been raised uh, um, on Slido in the last few minutes. So those are some questions for Ilona and uh, for Vincent. Um, Ilona, can I start with you and ask you to have a go at uh, two of those? Uh, and then I'll come to Vincent, and then I'll come to the other panelists. I appreciate the way the question was asked directly to me. <laughs> 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 to make sure that nobody else gets it. <laughs> well, everyone else can have a go. <laughs> yes, exactly. Okay, so how can territorial evidence be brought uh, to the policymakers? Well, this is indeed one of the key challenges of uh, the ESPON program, to make sure that all the results of our research activities are properly communicated uh, to the policymakers, and we have... Um, uh, several ways and methods and approaches how we do it um, in the framework of the uh, ESPON program. Uh, I think uh, one important uh, approach here is to ensure that uh, there are sufficient opportunities for the researchers and policy makers to meet and discuss the results of the research together to understand what should be the policy implications. Uh, of uh, any research results. Uh, another way uh, how this could be ensured, and we also find it, uh, according to our experience, uh, very efficient, is to allow also stakeholders sufficient opportunities to learn from each other's experiences. And this is why also in our introductory speech, together in the opening speech uh, that we, that we um, performed together with my colleague Laurent, we wanted to underline also this point that it is important that on the basis of this territorial evidence, the different experiences that we gather around Europe, that we allow sufficient room and opportunities for stakeholders, policymakers to learn uh, from each other, because only the ones who have already been struggling with a certain issue or in, in a certain policy field they can help the, the others who are still envisioning their policy to understand uh, what are the possible mistakes to avoid and what are the possible pathways uh, to take. Um, then the second question was about um, 
how how can we convince the politicians? Yep. <sighs> yes, how can we convince the politicians? Yes, I, I used to work for the public sector myself uh, before as as a civil servant, and even in yes, and even in that even in that status, it was quite a challenge to convince the politicians. Uh, simply because um, in in many in many instances, at least my experience was that politicians already came into office with their own values and beliefs, and they were looking for evidence to support their values and beliefs. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, it was working the other way around compared to what we theoretically and ideally uh, ideally expect. Uh, but at the same time, as I also underlined in my intervention, all the experiences that we have analyzed within ESPON, to, to, to just mention one example, our uh, SPEMA project that analyzed also uh, governance at the scale of functional urban areas, uh, there all stakeholders as one main key precondition for success mentioned that uh, there is a need of uh, a strong political leadership and strong uh, political um, involvement. So I believe that politicians should also be one of the key target audiences of all ESPON activities and we should really engage with them in this dialogue in the process of developing our research and also uh, communicating uh, the results. Uh, at the same time, I think for politicians in principle, it is indeed very important to understand what are the benefits for their areas uh, of any corporate of any cooperative practices and those benefits should be seen in relation as i also mentioned uh, to um, the potential benefits for their citizens for their inhabitants the potential uh, opportunities to mobilize more resources and do more for their local citizens with existing resources so from this resource perspective, I think we can also build a narrative for the politicians to, to buy this thinking. But I have to say that this is a continuous struggle and this is a challenge. Okay, excellent, thank you. Um, uh, Eric has said to me that he'd like to say something on this point. No, I, I think this brings up, we, we keep talking about this, how do we bring it to the, the stake, how do we bring it to the policy makers? And in this specific project I'm running now on specific, uh, geographic specificities and the arguments and narratives around that, what we realize is, we're being perceived as very useful, presented by the commission as their think tank, um, coming into then discussions, lots of stakeholders saying, we could use you, but the only problem is that my project is over. My problem, as at ESPON, I, I'm out of the, my funding is now soon finished. I'm just, this is just in terms of how we organize, how do we run this to that so that we become useful? And saying that we are communicating is not really enough this is about dialogue. This is about bringing the people together and being present in the room when they talk to each other. And I think we have a, a bit fundamental issue there of who we are. So it's very nice, very, very flattering that we're being introduced as a think tank. But, but uh, can we transform that promise into reality with the setup that we have? Precisely taking on board this idea of, of exchanges of narratives that oh, this planning is fundamentally about actors at different levels coming together. And if we're not there, this is not come, This is not going to happen. Simon, you want to continue on this, this question? Just a very okay, go for it. Uh, yep. Yeah. Just a brief reminder because we, we keep using this. We keep using this word politicians as if it's a monolithic sort of uh, entity. I mean, the U a UK politician in the UK has a very different world view and perspective on the world than, let's say, a Labour politician. So, and that happens across the across the board. And and I think we sometimes use. Uh, the values that people carry as a pejorative thing, that we should not have value. We all have to be rational beings, listen to numbers and facts and behave accordingly. None of us in this room does that. And we should never expect that a politician do that. I think it's quite legitimate for people to bring their values into the equation. And that's why the issue narrative is very important. Um, you know, well, maybe it takes a long time, but the point that Andres made about a lot of people who have no immigrants in their place, they still voted for Brexit and immigration is not a, therefore a big factor. I want to say, yes, that's correct. If you, we, if you only look at the number of immigrants, but the narrative of immigration is the one that people latched onto 
and use it to conform their Eurosceptic perspective. And that's how narratives work. Right, excellent. Thank you very much. Can we move on to the, some of these series of questions that I think probably are mostly targeted at Vincent about um, a need for a strategic plan for European mm -hmm. spatial development um, or a, and or a Europe-wide spatial planning authority. Could you just say a few words about those? And if the, those in control of Slido could um, put those questions up. Yeah, there's one of them, for example, is up there at the top now. And have a go as well. Let Vincent go first. Thank you. I really like this idea about a European-wide spatial planning authority. And if one's invented, I shall get my application form in um, <laughs> to join it, really. I, um, of course, that's not going to happen. We have one in a way now, actually, as Espon's creating the evidence. But the European Environment Agency has a lot to say about planning, as, as well as Espon. And... Um, and they always remind the European institutions that European institutions have a responsibility to make sure the territory, the land, is managed properly. And they have to keep repeating that because it's not happening. Certainly, we need something. We need something. And the way that I see it, the, the, the chasm I talked about before between uh, cohesion policy and spatial planning, of course, the history of that is that back in the 1980s, I said 1990s before, didn't I? I should have said 1980s. I'm losing track of time. But back in the 1980s, of course, there was a debate about the role of the European institutions in spatial planning. And some people thought that the EU would have some sort of formal responsibility, even a competence. But that was swept aside by some member states. And since then, the EU has been, the institutions have been very reluctant including ESPON until this most recent program, to get involved in working on spatial planning directly in the member states or even commenting on the sometimes appalling uh, planning decisions that are made. And, um, and I think it's time, and uh, uh, people will shoot me down in flames now, I'm sure, because they'll say it's completely impossible but it's time to start thinking again about the role of the EU in spatial planning. We can't have a situation where the, the European institutions are responsible for spending billions of euro when it's effectively managed or it's, um, the spatial planning is, is down to member states or regions within those member states. And I think the, you just, the, the institutions need to, need to take this responsibility more seriously. It may take 10 years to happen, but the debate should start now about getting involved in, in spatial planning again. Um, I'm skeptical um, as regards um, authorities, <laughs> in particular uh, planning authorities, uh, if we are not talking about land use planning, uh, land use planning there you need uh, authorities. Uh, but I wouldn't uh, advise anybody to uh, establish a, a, sp a spatial planning authority at the uh, European level. Uh, I would promote uh, something like a coordination unit. So I wouldn't call it authority, but a coordination unit. Uh, which is uh, established in between government, administration, and this uh, uh, also innovative uh, governance mechanism like the uh, Magenda Partnership, the Macro Regional uh, Partnerships. Uh, and uh, this coordination unit uh, should be equipped uh, with, uh, uh, you know, uh, enough, uh, let's say enough, uh, personal financial management uh, resources to support uh, such uh, soft policies uh, with their uh, governance systems. Right, okay, and Thomas, you wanted to say something on this point? Or on another point? Go for it. Yeah. Uh, I'm a little bit afraid that in our conversation here and then how dealing with uh, uh, how to communicate about uh, territorial uh, evidence towards policymakers, we miss the issue about uh, new narr narratives. Uh, new narratives are not just meant for policymakers. 
I think it's very important that there is a, a big uh, context and, and we, we are narrowing the discussion if we think it's a, it's a communication between scientists and policymakers. That's not what narratives is about. And all we heard in the morning was that we didn't pay much enough attention to this uh, until now. If we now uh, think of improving our policy uh, system, our planning system, well, that's, of course, it's always very important. But it's not uh, what, what we are dealing with when we speak about new narratives. Uh, I, I have seen in the previous uh, set of questions, once one question starting, shouldn't we start listening instead before answering? So I am interested in those kinds of questions which really go into, into, into the depths, uh, which really go into what you called values. What are the values of those regions? And not how can we frame or invent some uh, sophisticated use we ascribe to some regions. So that's what place-based or place-sensitive uh, uh, development would be about. Right, excellent. Um, I think we've gone through, well, perhaps touches upon also the question which is currently second on the screen there. How are we ensuring that new narratives and a new territorial agenda do not end up in a draw but become a real guidance for sectoral policies? I, I, I conclude there, Thomas, that your answer to that would be actually you need to see it a different way around. You need to go and listen to people and talk to people first before working out what those narratives should potentially be. Do you want to say something about that, Simon? Yes, because, because that, I think the second point that Thomas quite rightly said, um, and I sort of just went through that very quickly, I talked about narratives that can appeal to as many people as possible. I didn't mention policymakers. I mean, and that's, that's an issue. Every time researchers talk about communicating, they think they should communicate with policy, politicians. Or policy. Politicians come and go. What we need is to convince or to persuade is the better word, people. Because it's then people who can demand change on their politicians. They're the ones who vote for politicians. If you can persuade them, then it's their job to change the politics of the government and all of that. So I think this is a really, really important point. And for researchers, it's very important that our audience are people, not necessarily always politicians or what we call policy makers. And sure. that's how narratives work again. Go for it. Just one, yeah. one, one point. Uh, you can't put a narrative in a drawer because a narrative is not a document. It's like the new world paradigm. It wasn't an invention of OECD to write this document. It, they, they just commented what was evolving there. So it's not, not, not a, a strategy paper, I think, like that. The narrative is really uh, an, well, uh, an observation of, of ongoing uh, uh, developments well, put into a frame that we can use for, for our policy making. And just to add to what you just mentioned, I also believe that um, to make sure that territorial agenda does not end up in a drawer, we should not aim at having another brilliant document. We have plenty of those. But we should establish the territorial agenda as a process, as a process of dialogue, of negotiation, of agreement between the different actors and stakeholders involved in, um, in the territorial development at functional scales to help them understand their vision, their perspective, and also the way how they can implement it in, in practical sense. And from that perspective, I also do not really like this idea about having any kind of European spatial planning authority at pan-European level. I think it will kill the beauty of and diversity of the planning practices around Europe. I think we rather should encourage those bottom-up functional scale approaches and planning and governance uh, to ensure that we have the different solutions in place uh, to encourage people to learn from each other and the territorial agenda should support all of this and of course ESPON is always there to to help when needed with evidence. 
All right, excellent, thank you very much. Um, I, I do find that the questions in Slido quite amusing because some people are now writing in comments in Slido instead, contradicting the questions which have been raised by other participants. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of turning into an online discussion forum in its, in its own accord there um, in, in the online um, uh, discussion. And we're close to uh, being out of time. I'm just gonna ask to see if there's just one question from within the room here. So you, if you're the first person to put up your hand, you can ask a question. This gentleman here I saw first uh, happened to have chosen a, a good, um, a good spot in, fr in front of my eye line. He can ask the question. Please direct it to a, a, a panelist, um, ideally one panelist. Basically, it's more an answer to a question of, of, uh, from Vincent Nadine than, uh, than a question. Uh, you ask about, you ask, or you, you said about, uh, do we have or should we have a, a, a DG, uh, not only DG Regio, but the Commission uh, acting as a, as a planner at the EU level? I would say that. Uh, there are at least, I, I think, at least of two cases where the Commission uh, already uh, had a sort of planning attitude at the uh, at the EU level. Uh, the first one is the when the, the DG Move designed the core uh, ten transport network a couple of years ago. Basically, they used uh, SPON data uh, about uh, the city system. Uh, another example, which is more recent, it's about uh, cross border cooperation. Um, and it's about the new regulation and, and uh, the fact that the, the, co the, the DG Regio, uh, Nathalie uh, Ferskel will be there tomorrow, explains now to the programs that uh, Interreg is not only about funding projects, but it's uh, als also about funding uh, solutions to obstacles in all the cases that happen in the cross-border areas. And I also think about the creation of a coordination point uh, about cross-border obstacles in DG Regio. This is uh, planning in, in the function of coordinating uh, the different DGs and also coordinating uh, the EU with the uh, national and local stakeholders. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Do you want to respond to that, Vincent? No? no? Uh, no need to respond, apparently. So, in which case, um, I think that probably, at pretty much bang on three o'clock on time, uh, draws this uh, panel to a close. So give all of our panelists a warm round of applause, and we're going to move straight on to the next in round of introduction.